So today we are going to talk about nodal analysis, and I am going to teach you the nodal analysis technique simply by working example problems. So I am going to break this down into a series of steps that form kind of an algorithm for how to apply this technique, in my opinion, correctly. Um, you don't necessarily have to do the steps in this very specific order that I am going to give you. That being said, if you ask me for help on doing anything to ask, did you do it in the steps that I told you to do? And if you say no, I'm going to make you start over doing it the way that I'm trying to teach you. So just be forewarned. I am extraordinarily egotistical and I believe that my way is the correct way. So, all right. So let's consider the following circuit. Here we have a five ohm resistor. a 10 ohm resistor, here we have a 2 amp source, here we have a 20 ohm resistor, we're going to have a dependent current source over here, providing a current of 0 0.5 Vx, Up top, we have a 15 ohm resistor. Over which the voltage Vx is defined. So in this particular circuit, there are no resistor combinations that we could make to simplify things. There are no source combinations that we could make to simplify things. There's only one independent source in the circuit, so we couldn't even use superposition to try to make this easier if we wanted to. So we are left with effectively solving some form of systems of equations in order to determine the quantity of interest here, which for the sake of argument, let's say is the voltage Vx, okay? So what nodal analysis is, is a very formulaic approach to writing a system of equations. And it is done by performing multiple applications of Kirchhoff's current law, okay? So our first step will be to identify our nodes. So I'm going to do this much like I have every other time I've identified nodes. I hear the lids of highlighters opening up across the classroom, that's great. I'm gonna do it using different colors. So I have some node on the right that I have in red, or excuse me, uh, a node on the left that I have in red, some node on the right here, which will be in blue. I'll have a green node here in the middle of our circuit. And let's do a purple node down here at the bottom. So I have identified the four different nodes that this circuit contains. Now we will move on to step number two. Step number two is for us to select a reference or ground node. So what this means is that we are going to pick one of these four nodes to be the reference point for our circuit. We are effectively assigning it a voltage of zero and every other node will be measured with respect to that reference node, okay? So there, while any node can work, um, there are usually better choices than others. So I would argue in a circuit like this, where there are no voltage sources, and we'll talk about what happens when there are voltage sources in the circuit a little bit later on today, 
but in a circuit that contains no voltage sources, your best option is the node that has the most things connected to it. I have intentionally drawn this circuit such that there are exactly three elements connected to every node. Therefore, every single one of them is equally viable as a choice. So with all things being equal, we can just choose one at random here and it will not change the difficulty at which we're going to solve this in any way. So Camille, I'm going to put all of the uh, burden of this class on you. Pick one of these four nodes. The blue one, all right. So I'm going to indicate that this node is our reference node by putting a ground sign there, okay? So this effectively means that the voltage at this node is exactly zero and every other voltage will be measured with respect to that, okay? Step number four, excuse me, three, is going to be to assign nodal voltages, okay? So that means simply that if I call this red node over here on the left, node A, I believe that there is some nodal voltage VA at that node measured with respect to ground. Similarly, I can call this green node B, and so therefore there will be some nodal voltage VB, and I can call this purple node C so that there will be some nodal voltage VC. Okay. So let me explain this concept of nodal voltage in a little bit more detail. This is just a shorthand notation for the potential difference between two points in a circuit. So anywhere I see my nodal voltage VA, VB, or VC, that is the positive polarity terminal of my voltage, and ground is the negative polarity terminal of my voltage. So VC is just this voltage across our dependent current source with positive polarity on bottom, because it's measured between our purple node at the bottom and our ground node in blue on the top right. VB is just the voltage drop across the 20 ohm resistor, positive polarity on the left. Those are the exact same quantities, okay? So a nodal voltage, again, is simply a shorthand notation where wherever I have assigned the nodal voltage is considered to be the positive polarity terminal and ground is the negative polarity terminal for that particular voltage. All right, so we have set things up. Now we are going to get into the application. Yes, ma'am. So it's a car, it is the potential difference between that node and ground. So I was defining it in terms of single elements there to help you guys understand what it represents. But really VA is the voltage anywhere along this node with respect to the blue node, okay? So VA could be thought of as the voltage drop across the 15 ohm resistor with positive polarity on the left, um, or it can be thought of as the voltage drop across the five ohm resistor and the voltage drop across the 20 ohm resistor combined together, because that's a path that goes from node A to ground. Pretty much, yeah. All right, so our Fourth step here, and this is one that I see students struggle with. We are going to define controlling variables
in terms of our nodal voltages, okay? So what I mean by a controlling variable is a variable that controls a dependent source. So in this case, our voltage Vx at the top of our circuit is a controlling variable because it controls the amount of current that is supplied by that dependent source. So we need to figure out a way to express Vx, the voltage drop across the 15 ohm resistor up at the top in terms of our nodal voltages. So let me do this in a different color. So we are going to have Vx is equal to, and then some combination of nodal voltages, okay? So the positive polarity terminal of Vx is associated with what nodal voltage? Zero or ground, okay? So Vx is going to be equal to zero minus what nodal voltage is associated with the negative polarity terminal of Vx? Va. We're done. That's as difficult as it needs to be. Anytime you are defining a controlling voltage in terms of nodal voltages, it's just the voltage at the positive polarity terminal minus the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal. Full stop. Don't have to do anything other than that. In a step, in a moment, we are about to do or apply Kirchhoff's current law, um, where we're going to do something similar, but then we're going to be dividing by resistance. Okay. Um, so I want to be very clear whenever we're describing a current in a nodal analysis thing, we're going to have a difference in voltages divided by a resistance. Whenever we're describing a voltage, it's just going to be a difference in voltages. I'm saying this because a large portion of you guys are going to be writing equations, and then you're going to do something and say like Vx is equal to Va minus Vb over three ohms, which doesn't make any sense because Vx minus Va over three ohms or whatever is a current. Voltage divided by resistance gives you a current. Current can't equal voltage. That's a very, very common mistake that we're going to see. So I just wanted to make you aware. All right. So there are no other controlling variables that we need to concern ourselves with. So we can move along to step number five here. And this is to write a KCL equation at each non-reference node. Okay. So we have three nodes that aren't our reference for this particular circuit, node A, node B, and node C. So we're going to write a KCL equation at each of them. Okay. So let's start. at node A, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what we're going to do here, okay? So at node A, um, let me use this pink color. We are going to say that all of the currents that leave node A sum together to make zero. So we're using that particular formulation of Kirchhoff's current law. Currents that are leaving are going to be positive. Currents that are entering are going to be negative. We are using this specific formulation of Kirchhoff's current law to make sure that effectively all of our VA terms will have a positive sign when we're looking at node A and all of our VB and VC terms will wind up having, ne having a negative sign. So this is the tradition that will get you the least amount of spurious or extra minus signs throw in, thrown in that will cause algebraic mistakes, okay? So let's start with the current flowing up through the 15 ohm resistor. Our current is going to start at node A 
and it flows all the way through the 15 ohm resistor until it reaches ground. So the voltage drop across that 15 ohm resistor is VA minus zero. And then we're going to divide that voltage drop by the resistance of 15 ohms. So that's how I'm going to express that current flowing up and through the 15 ohm resistor in terms of my nodal voltages. I want to be very clear here. I'm expressing everything in terms of nodal voltages right now, which means I do not care at all what the polarity of Vx is. Vx doesn't even need to exist as far as I'm concerned when I'm writing these particular equations, okay? I'm gonna express all of my currents flowing through my resistors in terms of nodal voltages only. Vx will only show up when I'm dealing with that current source that depends on Vx, okay? So now let's write an expression for the current flowing to the right through the five ohm resistor. So the current starts at node A, flows through the five ohm resistor and ends at node B. So the voltage drop across the resistor is simply going to be VA minus VB. And then we divide it by our resistor value of five ohms. Now we have the current flowing down through the 10 ohm resistor. Would anybody care to take a stab at this one? That's absolutely correct, Brie. VA minus VC over 10 ohms. And then we set this equal to zero because those are the three terms or the three currents leaving our node A. Yes, ma'am. Because we're not worrying about the total path to ground, we're just worrying about the path to the next node. So that path from VB to ground will be taken care of when we write our Kirchhoff's current law equation at node B here in just a moment. So we just want the currents that are leaving node A and flowing to the closest node or the closest nodes. So through a single element there. Any other questions regarding our Kirchhoff's current law expression for node A? Everything seem okay? All right. So now let's do KCL at node B. So I'm gonna identify these currents in this light blue color. So we're gonna have this guy to the right, or excuse me, to the left, this guy down, and this guy to the right, okay? So who can tell me what the current directed to the left through the five ohm resistor should be written as in terms of our nodal voltages? Absolutely correct, Justin, thank you very much. So VB minus VA over five ohms. Just as a simple heads up here, what we wrote right there is exactly what we have right here, except negative, because the current is flowing in the opposite direction in this case. So that's another way to check things. All right, what about the current flowing down through our current source? So, the current source is providing two amps of current in the up direction, and we want to know how much current is flowing in the down direction. Negative two amps. All 
All right. And now we have the current flowing to the right through the 20 ohm resistor. Anybody care to, uh, care to take a crack at that one? VB minus zero, so VB over 20 ohms. Thank you, John. All right, so those are the three currents leaving node B, so we're done at node B. Now we'll move along to node C. All right, so let's do these in this neon green color. So we're gonna have this current up, this current up, and this current up. Those are all of the currents that are leaving node C. Let's start with the one on the left, the current flowing up through the 10 ohm resistor. Anybody care to venture a guess? Exactly right. VC minus VA over 10. Then we have the current flowing up through the two amp source. So just plus two amps. Then we have the current flowing up through our dependent source. So the one on the right. Mm -hmm. So it'll be negative 0 0.5 VX. We set this equal to zero. And now we are on our last step. I think will be step number six for us here. Solve the system of equations. Okay. So at present, we have, well, actually, so let me say something here. Justin, what's up? So we could substitute in negative VA. I wouldn't have any problem with that whatsoever. Um, I'm saying explicitly, I'm calling it 0 0.5 VX because that current source is supplying 0 0.5 VX, whatever VX happens to be, right? Then I would substitute in that relationship for VX into that equation if it is necessary. And so that's what I wanna talk about here, okay? So calculators that I brought today are these Casio 115s. They're only capable of solving a system of equations that has three equations and three unknowns, okay? But I encourage an awful lot of you to buy the Casio 991s, which are capable of solving a system of equations with four unknowns. So for those of you with the Casio 991, there's no need to make any substitution whatsoever. You can literally just use these four equations throw it into your calculator correctly and have it work everything out for you. Everybody who didn't buy the Casio 991 calculator now has to do the substitution that Justin suggested, okay? So applying that substitution where VX is simply negative VA is gonna look like VC minus VA over 10 ohms plus two amps, plus 0 0.5 VA is equal to zero. All right, so because the calculators that I brought are only capable of solving a three by three system, I'm going to talk now about the coefficients that you would put into your calculator for that three by three system. So I'm bringing up my system solver and I'm telling it that I want to work on a three by three system. 
and I am considering this equation one, this guy right here, equation two, and this guy right here, equation three, okay? So what should the coefficient of VA be in our first equation? One fifteenth plus one fifth plus one tenth. We don't need to do that math. Our calculator can do it for us. We can literally type in one fifteenth plus one fifth plus one tenth into our matrix thing, and the calculator takes care of it for us. All right. Our coefficient for VB should be what for our first equation? <coughs> So where's the only place we see a VB? We're looking at this equation right here. Where do we see VB? In that second term. Is it a positive or a negative? All right, so it's a negative. And that VB is being divided by five ohms. So I would argue that the coefficient for VB is negative one fifth. So I'm gonna put that into my calculator. What is the coefficient for VC in my first equation? Exactly right, negative one tenth. And then my constant term in my first equation is simply going to be zero because there are no constant terms on the left-hand side that I need to move over and everything is already set to zero. Now let's look at our second equation. What are the coefficients of VA? negative one-fifth. What are the coefficients of VB? Absolutely right, one-fifth plus one-twentieth. What is my coefficient for VC? Zero, because there's not a VC in that term or in that equation. What's my constant term going to be? So I have to move this to the right-hand side or any constant term to the right-hand side of the equal sign. So that negative two on the left-hand side of the equal sign looks like positive two on the right-hand side. Now let's look at our third expression. What's the coefficient for VA? So there's more than that. Right, so negative one-tenth plus 0 0.5. What's my coefficient for VB? Zero. My coefficient for VC? Positive one tenth. My constant term? Negative two. So now I have my system plugged in. Assuming I typed everything in right, my answer should come out here to be something. So what I got was VA is equal to negative 60 over 91 volts. VB is equal to 680 over 91 volts. And VC was equal to negative 1,580 over 91 volts. And so I would like for you guys to give me just a moment to check these effectively, because when I work this, I chose a different ground node. So. So let's see, what did I say was V1? So V1 is gonna be VA minus VC. All right. All right, we got the same answer. So 
we must have worked it out correctly. All right, so how did you guys feel about that? All we are doing in this analysis method is applying Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current law. That's literally it. But we were we are able to analyze any gnarly, ugly looking circuit using this methodology. Free, what was your question? So we okay. So what we found is the voltage at this node with respect to ground. We found the voltage at this node with respect to ground. And we found the voltage at this node with respect to ground, okay? okay? So let's take this one step further, all right? I said that we were trying to find Vx. What is Vx going to be now that we know our nodal voltages? So Vx is negative Va. So that is 60 over 91. Volts. Let's say that I wanted to find the power absorbed by our 5 ohm resistor. So I would argue that that is going to be simply VA minus VB quantity squared divided by five ohms, because now I have the information to get the voltage drop over the five ohm resistor. And because I'm finding the power, it doesn't particularly matter if I do VA minus VB or VB minus VA, because I'm going to wind up squaring it. What if I wanted to find um, the power supplied by my dependent source, right? So I would want the voltage drop across my dependent source where the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal, right? So this is the voltage drop across our dependent source where the current's flowing into the negative polarity terminal. What is that in terms of our nodal voltages? VC. What's the current flowing through our dependent source? 0.5 Vx or negative 0.5 Va. I can use those nodal voltages that we solve for there to, in one step, determine any possible quantity that I want in this circuit. Any voltage drop across any element, any current flowing through any element, or the power absorbed or supplied by any element. Once I know what all of the nodal voltages are, I'm one step away from knowing any possible quantity I could ever be asked, okay? Just by applying the simple relationships that we've already developed. Hannah. Um, I put, the negative sign there because it should be positive VC multiplied by positive 0 0.5 VX since we are finding the power supplied by that dependent source. Then I substituted the fact that VX is equal to negative VA, which is where that negative sign inside the parentheses is coming from. So I'm not taking into account what the actual sign of any of those quantities are. Whatever they are, that's the correct equation. And then I just do simple substitution. Yes. So Vx is the controlling variable, to be clear. Let me see what's going on in chat here. All right, so Gabe asked a question and said, um, what exactly is ground and how is it different than negative or is it the same thing? So ground, and I'm sorry if you asked this much earlier and then I talked for 25 minutes before answering your question, Gabe, but ground is simply a reference, okay? So in these circuits that we are analyzing, we are saying that our ground terminal is zero volts. It is an arbitrary choice. We could say that our reference voltage is 14 volts if we wanted to, 
that would just serve to make the math more difficult. The obvious choice for our reference is zero. Now in a real electrical system, we ground things out and stuff like that. And that means that we literally tie them using wires and rods and stuff like that to the earth, actual ground. Because for our frame of reference, the actual ground is zero potential energy. So that's why we call that node ground. It is our reference or our zero point for our circuit. So if we don't have a physical connection to ground, like um, the AC circuits and all that kind of stuff that power everything in this room, because the electricity that's distributed here in the United States doesn't actually have a ground reference in most situations, but we choose something to effectively serve as ground, typically our neutral wire. And we're just saying, well, that's our zero point so that we can measure everything with respect to that. Because if we don't have some frame of reference to use, it makes the math more difficult. Okay, so in this class, ground is simply a mathematical construct of, we are saying this thing is zero, and everything else is going to be measured with respect to it to make the math easier. That's it. Did that clarify things at all, Gabe? All right. Um, I think I interrupted somebody else's question. Camille, did I answer yours? Okay. I don't remember what it was now because I've ranted about things, but sure. Hannah, what's up? All right, so I would argue that you put this stuff in your calculator wrong, um, which is gonna happen a lot, if I'm being entirely honest, okay? Um, you guys are going to be asked to solve circuits like this very, very frequently, and that is going to require you to get in the habit of entering stuff into your calculator very quickly, but also correctly. So not trying to be a jackass, but I would, enter in all of your coefficients again, and then see if you get a different answer. And I would argue that you're probably going to, okay? Calculator error happens a lot, even to me. So I'm not trying to be insulting or dismissive, but if you got a different answer than me, you had to have entered your stuff into the calculator incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because you chose a four by four system of equations. So for your calculator, if you wanted to choose a different system of equations, you are to two to four, if you have a three by three system, press three. I solved it as a three by three system. You can solve it as a four by four system because you have that particular calculus, right? So what I mean by that specifically is you could look at this equation, this equation that I have labeled equation one and enter it into your calculator using the coefficients, right? So the coefficient for VA is one fifteenth plus one fifth plus one tenth. The coefficient for VB is negative one fifth. The coefficient for VC is negative one tenth. The constant term at the right hand side is equal to zero. Same thing for our second equation. For our third equation, however, you would have a coefficient for VA, a coefficient for VC, and a coefficient for VX because you can just treat VX like a variable because your calculator has four variable slots, right? Your fourth equation would come from this guy right here. So you could effectively say one VA plus zero VB plus zero VC plus one VX is equal to zero. And that is your fourth equation. So you, because you have that particular calculator have the luxury of choosing whether or not to actually perform that substitution or just enter the four equations that we've already determined. Does that make sense? Coefficients. I can understand VA as a coefficient. Mm -hmm. Is it a total coefficient? 
Yeah, so you add all those together. It's literally one fifteenth plus one fifth plus one tenth. And you can type it into your calculator just like that. All right, any other questions about this particular problem? Okay, so what we are going to do now is we're going to break things slightly by introducing voltage sources, okay? That is going to make two changes to our methodology, okay? It's just gonna add two steps. So I'm going to draw this big ugly circuit. Yep, I told you it was big and ugly. Almost done. All right, so this is our circuit. I heard a lot of, oh my gods and this, that's, and understandably some of you guys are on the verge of a full on panic attack because this is harder than anything that you've seen. And I would argue that with a very slight modification. The analysis steps that we just took for that much smaller and much more simple circuit, which was to some extent also a pain in the ass and a big step up in difficulty for what you guys have seen to this point. But anyway, with one small modification, we can handle stuff like this all day. Okay. So our step one is going to be exactly the same. We will identify our nodes. Um, because of a choice we're going to make in just a moment, I'm just going to, no, I just want to move this whole thing down a little to give myself some room. Sorry. So we have... This node at the top left, this node at the middle left, this node at the bottom, this node here in the middle. Um, this node at the top right, and this node at the middle right. So let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six nodes. Okay. All right, so 
now we are going to choose our reference node. Let me write that down. Step two also remains the same. So ultimately here, we will be able to solve this circuit just like the last one by choosing any node as our reference. That being said, whenever we have voltage sources in our circuit, instead of choosing the node that the most elements are connected to, which would obviously be the blue node for this particular circuit, instead, we are going to choose the node the most voltage sources are connected to. And the node the most voltage sources are connected to happens to be the green node at the bottom. So that is the node that I am going to choose for our reference. And we'll talk about why we make that decision in a moment. But the short answer is it's going to make the math easier. Okay. Now we are going to assign our nodal voltages. Okay, so I'm going to call this guy VA, this guy VB, here we have VC, we'll have VD in the middle, and VE over here, and we're done. Oh, I forgot to tell you where the controlling current IX is, that's important, so my apologies there. Um, that would have been problematic when our, we do our next step to find controlling variables if I don't tell you where it is. So, all right. So step four also remains exactly the same. So we only have one controlling variable in this system, the current IX, which is flowing right through the 10 ohm resistor. So somebody please tell me how I would express that current IX, this guy right here, in terms of our nodal voltages. VD minus VE over 10. Thank you, John. That's our only controlling variable. So that's the only one that we have to write there. Okay. Yes, John. So it is in terms of IX. So no, because they're both controlled by the same variable. Both of our dependent sources are controlled by the current IX. That's the only one that we need to write. Yep. If there were two different controlling variables, then we'd write two different equations. But. All righty. So we're going to skip step five, because step five is going to be a consequence of what we are about to see. So I'm going to leave that blank, and I'm going to give myself some room. I'm also going to skip step six because that will be a consequence of what we're about to do. And so let's go to step number seven. For all remaining non-reference nodes. So I'm going to tell you guys something right here. We are about to do some work or I'm about to do some work to show you something and then I'm going to wind up erasing all of it because it's technically incorrect, okay? So 
it's probably in your best interest, at least as far as neatness and all of that stuff, to not write what I'm about to do down because we're just going to wind up erasing it in a moment anyway. Okay. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's current law at node A. And I'm going to add up all of these currents that are leaving node A. And we are going to find out that there is a bit of a problem. Okay. So for KCL at node A, we're going to have the current directed to the left through the 4 ohm resistor. So that's simply going to be VA minus VC over 4 ohms. Then we're going to have the current directed down through our 2 ohm resistor, which is going to look like VA minus VD over 2 ohms. Then we're going to have the current directed diagonally down through the 3 ohm resistor, which will look like VA minus VD over 3 ohms. Then we have the current directed to the right through the current uh, through the voltage source. And this is where our problem arises, right? So this particular voltage source is an independent or excuse me, a dependent voltage source. And the voltage that is provided by this source depends on a current. That being said, we know absolutely nothing about what current flows through that current source, okay? There is no way that we can express how much current flows through that current source in terms of our nodal voltages. So really the best thing that I can do is call this current I dependent, and I'm gonna put LR here to indicate that it's flowing from left to right. We don't know what it is, so we've just introduced another variable that we'll have to solve for somewhere down the line. Okay. We're gonna set this equal to zero. Now, we're going to apply Kirchhoff's current law at node B. So let's write these currents in this light green color. So we're going to have this guy to the left, this guy down, and this guy to the right. So I'll start with the easy ones. Um, let's do the current down is going to be VB minus VD over six. Then I'm going to have the current to the right, which is going to be VB minus VE over eight. Then I'm going to have the current flowing to the left, which is through our dependent source. So I'm going to call this guy I dependent from right to left. Uh, Cameron? Yes. They are in parallel. So yes, we could have, or we can leave it alone because the nodal analysis doesn't particularly care. But yes, we could absolutely combine those two elements because they are in parallel if we so chose. I chose not to do so. All right, so I'm gonna write down I dependent right to left. Set this equal to zero. So I now have two equations and they both effectively have that same unknown quantity in them but in opposite directions, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply add these equations together, okay? Let me explain why I can do that. Our KCL equation at node A, all of those terms is equal to zero. For our KCL equation at node B, all of those terms together is equal to zero. 
So if I add those two equations together, what I am saying is zero plus zero is equal to zero. Does anybody have a problem with that? So if I add these two equations together, what I will get is VA minus VC over four ohms plus VA minus VD over two ohms plus VA minus VD over three ohms plus I dependent from left to right plus I dependent from right to left plus VB minus VD over six ohms plus VB minus VE over eight ohms is equal to zero. And I can observe that since these are the same exact currents, but flowing in opposite directions, when I add them together, they have to cancel each other out, okay? So now let's talk about how we could come to that same result without having to do all of that work. And so I'm going to introduce the concept of a super node, okay? So any time that we have a voltage source, we will have a super node. So I am going to put a blob effectively around this voltage source, okay? And what we're going to do is we're simply going to sum the currents that are leaving the super node. What this does is takes care of the fact that that internal current flowing through the voltage source is gonna wind up canceling itself out when we count it in both directions, okay? So if I, let me modify step number five here. or excuse me, step number six, write KCL equation for all supernodes which do not contain our reference or ground. Okay. So I've encapsulated this particular voltage source. I've identified it as a supernode. And now I'm just going to add the currents that leave that supernode up and set it equal to zero. So that's going to be VA minus VC over four plus VA minus VD over two plus VA minus VD over three. So those are all of the currents leaving the A side of the supernode. To that, I will add VB minus VD over six plus VB minus VE over eight are all of the currents that are leaving the B side of the supernode. And I get the exact same relationship that I got down here, okay? So I'm simply gonna write all this stuff down again. VA minus VC over four ohms plus VA minus VD over two ohms plus VA minus VD over three ohms plus VB minus VD over six ohms plus VB minus VE over eight ohms is equal to zero. And now I'm gonna erase all of this stuff up here because we've taken it into account. So the whole purpose of this supernode concept is so that we never have to worry about how to express the current that's flowing through a voltage source in terms of our nodal voltages, because to put it simply, we can't do it. So we're avoiding that by effectively combining Kirchhoff's current law expressions together 
to get around that limitation. And that's where the super node comes from. Okay. Now there is a little bit of a problem here. And so that is what we're going to address with step number five, okay? Our KCL expression for these two super nodes only gives us one equation. So we have to have one other equation for our supernode because there are two unknowns. So we need to take that into account. That second relationship comes from the voltage source itself. So step number five is going to be right voltage relationship equations, okay? We are going to do this for every voltage source, okay? So let's talk about how we're going to do this. The voltage source at the top, what voltage does it supply? 5IX. So I'm going to write down 5IX is equal to what is the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal of that voltage source? VA. What is the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal of that voltage source? VB. We're done the exact same thing we did to define a controlling voltage in the previous example. We are gonna define every voltage drop across a voltage source in terms of the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal minus the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal, okay? So we have two other voltage sources, so let's go ahead and take care of those. So I have a 15 volt source over here on the left. So I'm gonna have 15 volts is equal to what? VC minus zero, which is just VC. And lastly, we have the nine volt source kind of in the middle. VD, nine volts will be equal to VD. Thank you, Kevin. it might be kind of obvious now why I chose my reference node to be the one that touches the largest number of voltage sources, because now I don't have to solve for the nodal voltage VC or VD at all. They were given to me because of where I chose my ground, okay? So we have effectively eliminated two equations from our system by making an intelligent choice as to where to put our reference node. Okay, so let's talk our way through things here just really quickly, okay? So we have our controlling variable equation, so that's number one. We have these three equations, so that's one, two, and uh, so let's call that two, three, and four for the sake of argument. We have this guy right here, which makes five, I feel like I am missing something here, so let me check something. Three voltage relationship equations. Oh, no, no, sorry. I, I, I was spacing out here. I thought I was going to need seven equations, but I'm only going to need six. Um, the reason why I say that is because I have my five nodal voltages, VA, VB, VC, VD, and VE, and then I also have IX as another quantity. So I have five of the six equations that I need. So my last equation is going to come from writing a KCL expression for any remaining non-reference nodes. So let me talk about this really quickly, right? Anytime we have a voltage source, we are going to have a super node. So technically speaking,
this big blob at the bottom is also a supernode where I've lumped those two voltage sources together effectively inside of one supernode because they share that point of connection, which we've called ground. We never write a KCL expression for the ground node. So we never write a KCL expression for a supernode that contains ground. The only relationships that we need to get out of it are these two voltage relationships. Our supernode contained two nodes, node C and nodes D. And we have two equations telling us what node C and node D are. We don't need any other information about them at all, okay? So we wrote a KCL equation for supernode A and B. We have a voltage relationship equation for nodes C and D. So literally the only thing we have left to do is write a KCL expression at node E and we're done, okay? So it's the only node that's left and it doesn't contain ground or it's not the reference node, okay? So that's what our last step has to be. So, uh, sorry, let me do this in... No, I already did that green color. Um, I did orange. Let's do this light pink. So we want this current up, this current to the left, and this current down in terms of our nodal voltages. <laughs> So we'll have KCL at node E. Our current up is going to be VE minus VB over eight. Our current to the left is going to be VE minus VD over 10. Our current down is going to be VE over five. Set this equal to zero. And this is equation six. And then our last step would be to solve this system, which I am not going to bother to do because of time constraints. I do want to mention something though. On your exams, the largest system of equation that I expect you to be able to solve is a three by three system, okay? So something akin to that first problem that we worked where a simple substitution would get it down into a three by three system, okay? I'm not going to make you guys solve anything larger than that. As I mentioned in class previously, if you happen to have the Casio 991 calculator that is capable of solving a four by four system, literally having that calculator and knowing how to use it can save you some small amount of time because you won't have to make that substitution if it's necessary to bring your system down to a three by three system, okay? It is not required. When I work the exams, I work it using a calculator that can only solve a three by three system. And what I do is effectively, I make sure that I can solve the entire exam in about 30 minutes. And if I can do it in 30 minutes, I expect you guys to be able to do it in two hours, okay? So I'm not putting anything on, like, if, if it took me an hour to solve it, it would be far too long for you guys to do it in that reasonable amount of time, or in a reasonable amount of time, okay? So for your exams, the most, the largest thing that I expect you to be able to do is a three by three system. Your homeworks is an entirely different bag of cats, okay? Now, to be clear, I did not write these homework problems, but if you look at the last problem on the homework set for this material, I believe it involves in solving uh, an 11 equation, 11 unknown system. For the love of God, use MathCAD, okay? I would argue that MathCAD or something like that is even better than like, I don't particularly care for Wolfram Alpha and all that kind of stuff. You guys, as students, have access to MathCAD. Learn to use it. If you have questions about how to use MathCAD, I will be happy to answer them 
outside of our official lecture time and all that kind of good stuff, because I know that you guys are supposed to know how to use it from your engineering 120 series. I understand completely. It's been a while. I'm happy to show you tips, tricks, and all that kind of jazz, but I don't want to eat up a bunch of time that we need to be doing other things with, okay? I cannot encourage you enough to go down the hallway and look at the little bulletin board on our left and use the QR code that says need MathCAD or something like that, and then download the damn files today to do your homework later on. Because I'm telling you very emphatically, the last problem on this homework set is a, it's got nine nodes and two controlling variables. So it is an 11 equation, 11 unknown system. Doing it with literally anything other than a computer is completely and utterly idiotic. All right, that's the end of my run. Yes, Hannah. Okay, so the 15 volt source there on the bottom left, what is the nodal voltage that is associated with the positive polarity terminal of that voltage source? What is the nodal voltage that's associated with the negative polarity terminal of that voltage source? Right, so 15 is equal to VC minus zero. Same thing for the nine volt source, exact same thing we did for the five IX up top. Anytime we're trying to express a voltage in terms of nodal voltages, it will be the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal minus the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal. Always, always, always. Yes, ma'am. Which one is step seven? It was the only node that I hadn't done yet. So we had an equation for node is A and B because that's our big KCL equation at our super node. Um, we don't write equations for nodes C and D because they are part of a super node that contains the reference node. So the only node that's left is E. So any other questions? Alrighty, you guys have about 33 minutes to do the in-class assignment. So I'll be happy to float around the room and answer any questions you might have.